Well, good morning. Wow, I really, uh, I can't believe this day's here. I mean, I, not that I didn't know it was coming, I just, uh, it still feels like a surprise. It still feels like it came out of nowhere, but um, I wanted to say too, um, so Emma, our one-year-old, is uh, not feeling well. If you'd be praying for her, she had a little, little, tiny little baby cough. It was keeping her up at night, and uh, she's all, all kinds of fluids coming out of the face area, so uh, she's uh, not sleeping well, but she needs to sleep, and so Kendra stayed home with her today. She was really disappointed to not be able to be here today. Um, we do plan on being at the, the uh, picnic coming up. Do we, do we have a date for that yet, Kendra, or no? Okay, but it's after Labor Day. I, I had mistakenly thought it was Labor Day, but I was corrected. It's after Labor Day, um, but yeah, we do plan to see you all there, so hopefully, hopefully everybody here can make it there too, but well, so this morning, we're going to finish up First Peter, and uh, I, you know, I was about to say like, and you, some of you are like, yeah, sure, Scott, and like, no, you know that I can do it. You're just thinking, oh, great, we're going to be here all day. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best. This morning, as we finish up First Peter, I, I want to say, you know, it, it was really interesting to me um, doing this series. I, um, when we finished up Exodus, actually for a while in Exodus, I thought we were going to be doing John. That's what I really wanted to do was the Gospel of John, and I just kind of had this, this uh, just really felt drawn by the Spirit to First Peter, and I didn't know why, and I'm not sure I still entirely do know why, but I've been, I've been very much enjoying First Peter. I've very much enjoyed studying through that. It's been, it's been a while since I really spent a lot of time in First Peter, and um, it's, it's really interesting to me. I, f- I just feel more and more watching the news, and with everything going on, it just feels like very dark times, doesn't it? just feels like very dark times and uh, times where people are feeling very isolated, um, very, very alone, where there's just a lot of um, bitterness and resentment, division, um, a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness. And, uh, and it's very fitting, you know, as we study the, this letter written by the Apostle Peter, he's writing to people that feel exactly that way. And in many ways for different reasons, but people who just feel totally alone, totally misunderstood, people who are not being treated well. He's made references to them being verbally attacked, maybe even physically attacked, to people abusing them and and attacking them on all sides, just feeling like outcasts in the society they live in, people who in many cases are probably literally being shunned by their families because they follow Jesus. And uh, as as he's writing to these people, they're, they're in dark times right now. Things are not going well. Things are not going well. And Peter has been trying to encourage them and trying to remind them what matters. And he's been trying really to give them a, an idea of this is how a follower of Jesus lives in a time just like this. And how do we know how a follower of, follower of Jesus lives in this situation? Well, because we have an example. Because we follow Jesus and Jesus went through hard times. Did you know that? A yeah. little, little bit. It was a little bit difficult for him sometimes. Yeah, he, he went through a lot, didn't he? Jesus went through hard times himself. He is no stranger to suffering. He's well acquainted with it. Right? And, and Peter says, hey, if we're looking for an example of what do we do when faced with these kinds of circumstances, we have an example right in front of us. It's Jesus. You know, the guy that we're following, that we talk about all the time, we could learn a thing or two from him. And that's, that's very much what Peter's message has been throughout this letter. And so I just find it so refreshing. And as we wrap it up this morning, Peter is just going to continue, just like he's been saying, is as you suffer, suffer like Jesus. That's kind of been a, the resounding message throughout this letter, is as you suffer, suffer like Jesus. Suffer like him. And we're going to look at three aspects of that this morning. I think, I think as Peter's kind of wrapping up his, his main thoughts, and then he's going to end with, you know, some greetings and stuff, um, I think there's kind of three main ideas he has left about what it means to suffer like Jesus, what it means that as you're suffering, as you're going through these hard times, to be more and more like Jesus. And so he's, he's got kind of three, three more ideas, and those, those ideas are, he says, suffer like Jesus by being weird like Jesus, suffer like Jesus by standing firm like Jesus, and suffer like Jesus by loving Jesus' family well like he does. Before we dive into it, though, I, I want to, let's just take a moment to pray. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that as we study your word this morning, that you would, um, God, that you would really bring it alive to us this morning. Lord, I know that there's a lot of hurt in this room right now. There's, there's happiness in here too. There's a lot, of, a lot of different emotions in here right now. God, I just pray that whatever you've been trying to speak to each of us, Lord, if there's somebody here that you've been trying to communicate something to them, I pray that you would bring it to light right now. I pray that as we study your word that you would really speak through it. Spirit, that you would, that you would come and speak to each heart here. God, give us ears to hear. Speak to us and lead us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I almost feel like I want to just shut up and just let him speak for a while. So Peter says, suffer like Jesus. How do you do that? First of all, be weird. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're like, well, Scott, of course you would say that because you're weird. And I don't even mean weird like me. I mean weird like Jesus is weird. Here's, here's what he says. We're going we're gonna to pick it up right where we left off. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. We're, and we're just going to pause and, and talk through this a little bit. So, so Peter's, Peter's saying a few things. He's saying, first of all, even though it was unjust and wrong what Jesus had to go through, all that Jesus went through, he did it anyway. Now, why did he do it? Why did Jesus suffer? Why did he take the persecution and the attacks? Why did he take the literal attacks and the crucifixion and the whipping and everything else that went with that? Why did Jesus take that? What's that? He was done with sin. Yeah. Yeah, what else? What was the point of all that? Why did Jesus go through all that? He took it all for us, didn't he? Right? Jesus died for our sin, didn't he? Right? Am I crazy? Did he do that? Okay, I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah, he did that for our sin, didn't he? So if Jesus died so that our sin could be over with, Maybe we ought to do the same. Let's let our sin be over with, right? Right? Even though Jesus didn't have to do that, he chose to anyway for our sake. Peter says, okay, so take up the same mindset. Instead of wasting our lives chasing whatever feels good, because that's what people around us are going to do. That's what, if, if you remember a time before you knew Jesus, I'm sure you can remember that. Or even as you follow Jesus, I'm sure you've had your ups and downs. I think we can all think of a time in our lives when we were just chasing whatever we wanted, chasing pleasure, chasing whatever felt good at the moment, not thinking about what it meant for the long term, for us and for other people and, and for God, not really even thinking about it. But Jesus died once for sin to be taken away from us. So let's have the same attitude. Let's move on. We've spent enough time living that way, Peter says. Right? Now, a, a, lot, of, a lot of times we fall into this trap, a lot of Christians fall in this trap of thinking, if I'm good, if I do the right thing, God is always going to reward that and everything will go, go well. And, and when you do the right thing and then things don't turn out the way you want, what gives? I gave you what you want, where's what I want, right? We often can fall into this very transactional way of looking at our relationship with God. We talked about this a little bit last week, right? Where we think if we're doing good, good things should always come to us. And if we're doing bad, that's the only time that bad things should come to us. In re reality, God never promised that. I mean, there is some sense of like, you know, if you eat healthy, you have to deny yourself the pleasure of, of eating that thing you want right now. Like you have to say no to that donut or that brownie or whatever. But in the long run, you feel better. You have better health outcomes, right? And so in general, life is better when you say no, at least some of the time, <laughs> to that donut or the, the cookie or whatever. 
right? In the same way, when we live wholesome lives, when we live in accordance to God's will, it does turn out better. Like, like in general, life will be better. If you chase happiness, you won't be happy, right? That's the worst thing you can do. If you want to be happy, to chase happiness, you're just going to be miserable. But if you obey God, the life you have will be more joyful and more wholesome and more worthwhile and meaningful and have more purpose and more hope and all around, that's just a better life. So there is truth to that. That being said, there's a reason people say no, no good deed goes unpunished. Am I right? Have you ever done the right thing and been absolutely punished by it? Punished for it? Yeah. Why? Because of the people around us. Even when you do the right thing, people around you don't necessarily appreciate you doing what you did even if it was the right thing to do, sometimes especially if it was the right thing to do. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons for that. But what Peter is saying is, you, you know that there are people around you who are living lives that don't honor God. And you know what? If they don't follow Jesus, that's not surprising. Like, well, yeah, of course. Of course they live that way. Maybe I used to live that way too. But you know what? I follow Jesus now, so I'm going to be different. I'm going to be weird. People aren't always going to appreciate that. I'm going to make decisions in life that people are just going to look at and think that's crazy. Why would you do that to yourself? Right? And there's a reason for it. There's good reasons for it. And we can have a conversation about that. But at the end of the day, people are going to not necessarily think highly of you for, for doing the right thing. Now, now Paul lists this, these particular sins he lists here. You know, he t- uses this word like, you know, the NIV translates it debauchery. And it's basically just like, you know, anything that like is lacking moral constraint right but especially used of like sex or or even violence of just having no restraint at all no filter right nothing nothing inhibiting you or like what's translated in niv lust you know basically just an impulse towards immorality of some kind he uses words that are translated like drunkenness orgies carousing you'll find lists like this words like this are are translated a variety of ways in different bible translations you look at because it's just kind of hard to capture the right thing Basically, what these all have in common is just a total lack of, of self-control. You know, a lot of these words just have to do with, with sex and drinking and, and excesses of every kind. But basically, just having no inhibitions, nothing holding you back. You just do whatever feels good. Just total hedonism. Just do whatever you like. And then last and worst of all, and it's tied up with all these, what the NIV translates, detestable idolatry. You know, not the likable kind, the detestable kind, Right? And it, it's funny, in our culture, right, we have, we have this distinction be, between, like, good, wholesome religious people and, like, crazy, wild party people, right? In our culture, those are, like, two different, two different ideas. In the culture Peter's writing to, the culture that these people live in, religion and, that, and partying are very much integrated. The people who are doing the most partying, the most craziness, the most drunkenness that, you know, the NIV uses the word orgies for a reason, the most of this kind of stuff going on, it was part of religious festivals, right? These different festivals where you're worshiping these false gods, these idols, these religious worship practices that involve basically everybody just getting wasted and being stupid and just going crazy, just totally letting loose and being absolutely crazy, not thinking about how is this going to affect me in the long term, not thinking about how is this going to affect other people, am I doing wrong to other people? No, just do whatever feels good right now. Like that was part of their religion in a lot of cases. For Greeks and Romans in particular that are, that are hearing this, that's their religion. That's what they do to worship. And Peter says, you've spent enough time living like the people around you. You've spent enough time living this way. Live for God and you know what? there's going to be a cost to it. It's going to make you seem weird. Now, you might think about what I'm describing, like how they, how they practiced their worship back then, and worshiping these false gods. That sounds crazy to you. Guess what? The way we live sounded crazy to them. The, the way that Jesus calls us to live sounded crazy to people. You know, I, I was um, talking to somebody recently, and she was, she was just talking about how she, this, this other guy she had recently met and they were, you know, he was talking about how like a while back he was going to move to Australia to live with this girl that he met online and had never met in person, but they were going to move in together in Australia. And like, okay, you know, a lot of, a lot of red flags there, but you know, it, it, he had his plane ticket and everything and she canceled at the last minute. And then he was, he made some comment about like, I guess, a, well, but of course now I'm a Christian. So like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sleep with anybody unless I was married to them or engaged to them. 
which, which then I thought, like, wow, engaged. Okay, that's where the standard's at. But, like, well, that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> you know, but, she, she, but she's, she's like, can you believe that? Like, as she's telling me this story, she's just like, you, you know those conversations where somebody says something and they're expecting you to react a certain way and you don't react that certain way and then it feels really awkward? You know what I'm talking about? It was kind of like that where she's just expecting me to react some way. I'm like, well, I mean, I, I'm a pastor. I guess this is normal for me. Yeah, like, you know, like, like, but to her, it's just like, so she repeats it, like, because I didn't react right. You know, that's what people always do. So she repeats it, like, she, like, so he doesn't even have sex with anyone unless he's engaged or married. I'm just like, yeah, okay. I mean, my wife and I waited, you know, is that, I guess nobody does that anymore. I guess it's completely dead now. You know, thank you, thank you to the 60s or whatever. I don't know. But, but like, to her, that's just unimaginable. Now, she, she's not a Christian at all. Like, she, you know, but, but like, she's totally mainstream, People her age today, people my age today, people in their, in their 50s and 60s today and, and beyond, I mean, there's no constraint, right? That's, that's the new normal. And to her, it's mind-boggling that anybody would like, you know, want to have sex with a person and then not go do it. You know, like what? So you just don't do it? You know, and, and it's, there's still expectations and constraints, you know, it's got to be consensual. Like, that's still a virtue in our society. But, like, that's about it. That's the last virtue when it comes to sex in our society, you know? And, and like, to her, it's just shocking that anybody would wait till marriage. And it's like, it, it can be done. A lot of people have done it, you know? It's not as, not as hard as it sounds, as, as you make it sound, right? But, like, it can be done. It can be done, you know, but it just sounds mind-boggling to her. Right? In the same way, Peter's, Peter's like, when you follow Jesus, you're going to be weird. And if you've been doing it a while, you know, it's just, you get used to it, but like, you might forget that people around you find it as weird as they do. You're just going to be different. And that's really challenging. That's very challenging. Being like the one person out. Nobody likes to be left out. Nobody likes to be the one person who's different from everybody else. Well, sometimes we like it in a good way. Right? It brings you some attention and look how radical I am, you know. But like, even then we're doing it for the attention and approval of other people, right? Nobody wants to be isolated. Nobody wants to be singled out for being different from everybody around them. Well, guess what? When we follow Jesus, that's going to happen a lot. And Peter says, get ready for that. But he says, but you know what? Let him judge you. Let him think what they're going to think, because you know why? Because they're going to have to give an account to the one who's, who's very much ready to judge the living and the dead. Right? And he makes this comment about pre- gospel pre- being preached to those who are now dead and this whole thing. Ba- basically, the point he's trying to make is, like, death is not the end. That there's, there's a judgment coming. There's going to be a final result to this. That the, whether you choose God or not is going to have long-term consequences. Forget how you're treated right now. In the long run, it's in your best interest to go God's way. In the long run, it's better to give your allegiance to God and live for him. And receive salvation in the end. He's, he's saying this life is not all there is. So, get ready to be weird. Get ready for people to think you're crazy. Now, if people think you're crazy because of you, repent, repent of that, okay? I mean, or if it's harmless craziness, that's fine, you know. But like, if people think poorly of you for doing the right thing, hold your head up high. That's nothing to be ashamed of. If people think poorly of you because you're being a jerk... Well, that's a, that's a different story. And that leads us to the next thing. He's going to say, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want an example for how do we live in these crazy times we live in, be like Jesus by suffering like him. Now, now we're going we're gonna to jump down a few verses actually to verse, um, to verse 12. We're going to come back to that section later, verses 7 through 11. I'm, I'm doing things a little out of order this morning, but um, you know, Peter put it in the wrong order, so I gotta, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I felt really conflicted about doing things out of order because it feels really wrong to me. It's like, this is God's word. He, he put it this way for a reason. Anyway, well, we're going to jump down to verse 12. Uh, he writes, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you were insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear the name. 
For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And he's going to quote Proverbs 11.31 here. He says, And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Right? So he says, don't be surprised. He says, when people reject you, when people treat you poorly because of your faith in Jesus, don't sit around feeling sorry for yourself. Be thankful that God has accepted you. Don't sit around moping that you've been rejected by people. Be thankful that God has accepted you. And if God accepted you, who cares what they think? What does their opinion matter? What made them so important? God has accepted you. What more do you need? Like, he's, he's the one who's going to judge the living and the dead. He's the one whose opinion really counts at the end of the day, and he's accepted you. He has said, if you come to me and you repent and you commit yourself to me, you'll be part of my family and you're in. You're part of my family, and I'll look out for you, and you'll be okay. What else do you need beyond that point? Now, being rejected hurts. Don't want to downplay that. Being rejected hurts. But if God has accepted you, then God has accepted you, and it's settled. What more needs to be said? Who cares what anybody else thinks? Now, Peter goes out of his way to mention, like, but remember, if you suffer, it better be because of Jesus and not because you're a jerk. And it, like he throws in like murder and thievery, you know, in there like, you know, like if, if people hate you, don't let it be because you're a murderer. Okay, that's a low bar. You know, <laughs> was that really that big of a problem back then that the Christians are like, well, maybe if I go murder someone, people will like me better. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. All right. But he says, he says, if people reject you, I mean, let it be for good reasons. Hey, if you're a jerk to somebody, apologize for that. Apologize for that. If, you're, if your political theories are crazy because you listen to conspiracy theories on the internet and you're, you're not careful about how you get your information, I know I'm speaking very broadly. Everybody's get, some of you are getting tensed up like, wait, what are you saying? Like, which conspiracy theories? Because that's the question, right? Just the ones, I, the ones I believe are right. The other ones are the crazy ones, right? But I'm just, I'm just making a blat- blanket statement about like, you know, if you believe crazy things because you read it on the internet from a very unreliable source, repent of that. I mean, at least as soon as you find out it's an unreliable source. Like, repent of that. Apologize for that. Walk back on that. Don't walk back, walk back on your faith in Jesus. Don't apologize for your faith in Jesus. Don't apologize for doing what Jesus commands you to do, no matter who likes it and who doesn't like it. Lift your head high and don't be ashamed of that. And the rejection will come. It'll happen. Some of that rejection you reserve, some, you, you deserve because of the way you treat people. That, that could happen. But when rejection comes because of Jesus, don't be ashamed of that and don't ever apologize for that and don't ever feel like you need to walk that back to get people's approval. You have God's approval and that's all you need. Now, and he makes this this statement again, like kind of an ambiguous statement where he's talking about like judgment needs to come on our own household first. Basically, what what he's saying is basically we are going to go through a pressure cooker. Like the, the world that we live in, the life that we live in, especially in these times, it's a fiery ordeal is what he calls it, right? He says, don't be surprised that, by that. And basically what he's saying is, you know what? Not everybody's going to make it through. There are going to be people who start out having faith in Jesus that are going to give up because it's going to get too hard. That they were all right, they were on board until it cost them what, they, what it cost them or they thought it was going to cost them what they thought it was going to cost them and they gave up. It's going to happen. I'm sure you know people like that. Maybe you've been there yourself. Not everybody's going to make it through this ordeal. Not not everybody's going to make it through the difficulties that we face, the, the, the attacks on your reputation, the rejection from people. Not everybody's going to take that. And, and Peter's saying, like, realize, like, the judgment that matters is in the end. The judgment that matters is what God is going to do. If God has approved you, that's all that matters. So be faithful. Hang in there. Stand your ground. Why? Because Jesus did. When Jesus was faced with attacks, the unjust suffering he took, he didn't deserve that. Jesus took it because it mattered, because it was important. He took it for you and me. Let him come. Let him attack me. Let him hate me. Whatever they're going to do. It's not like I like it, but there's something more important here. And you know what? As long as I'm doing the will of my Father in heaven, let him think whatever they want to think. Let him do whatever they want to do. Now, maybe there's a situation 
like Peter said back in chapter three about that maybe there's a situation where I get to explain the hope that I have in me, right? Maybe there's a situation where I can explain why I live this way and that'll be meaningful to somebody and that will draw somebody that much closer to Jesus. That could happen and let's be ready for that, like Peter says, in and out of season, right? Let's be ready for that. But at the same time, like there will be times where you're misunderstood and you have to live with that where you're rejected and you have to live with that, stand firm because God understands you. God accepts you. God knows you. And you don't really need anything else than that. You really don't need anyone else's approval as much as you might want it, right? But he says, says, so suffer well. Suffer well. What matters is God's opinion. So if you're going to suffer, suffer well. Like he says in verse 19, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Commit that same word when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, I I commend my spirit to you, right? The same way Jesus said, God, I, I commit myself to you. Here you go, here's me. In that same way, commit to Jesus. Commit yourself to your creator and trust him with you. Trust him with your life, with your well-being, with your sense of acceptance. Trust God with that because he is the only one who can be responsible with it. So suffer like Jesus by being weird like Jesus, by standing your ground like Jesus did. And lastly, he's going to say suffer like Jesus by loving his family well, by loving God's family well. We're going to jump back for a second to verses 7 through 11 in chapter 4. We're going to read those verses and then we're going to jump down to chapter 5, okay? He says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So this is built on the premise, he says, built on the premise that there is a future reality, right? that Jesus is going to return, that God is going to make everything right. And so when he says the end of all things is near, that's what he's talking about, is that Jesus is going to come back. God is going to set everything right in the world. Judgment will happen. That those who do injustice will get what they have coming to them unless grace prevails. And we pray that grace prevails. That those who do defy God, who ultimately reject God, will receive exactly what they deserve. And those who commit themselves to Jesus will receive, receive exactly what we do not deserve. And that is his grace and his love and to spend eternity with him. There should be something reassuring in that. Not like you should walk in, you know, like walk into work and you feel rejected by all these people and it's like, well, you know what? You're all going to be rotten in hell soon. So like, you know, not, not having that kind of attitude at all. That's not, not at all what you need to take from this. But the end of all things is near. And if that's true, Peter says, here's what should happen. First of all, you need to think rightly. You need to be clear-minded so you can pray. Now, there's a lot we could unpack there. I don't even completely understand what that means. But he says you need to be clear-minded. It's sober-minded so that you can pray. That should scare us a little bit, right? He He says also, persist in your love for one another that covers over sins. He makes this statement that love covers a multitude of sins, right? Now what he means by that, he's not talking necessarily about the fact that, you know, God's grace, God's love covers over our sins, although that's a beautiful way to put it. And he's not talking about treating sin like sweeping it under the rug and pretending it's not there. Here's what he's really talking about. He's talking about that in a community, in a family of people, sooner or later, somebody is going to step on your toes. You put people in a room together, Sooner or later, somebody's going to be mean to somebody. Somebody's going to hurt somebody's feelings. Somebody's going to do something absolutely wrong and unjust to somebody else. It's going to happen. And what happens then? Well, you step on their toes right back, right? I mean, that's how I dance anyway. I mean, I'm just kidding. I, you don't want to see me dance. Right? When somebody hurts you, 
what do we do? We hurt him back, right? Or somebody that I care about gets hurt, and I hurt them back on their behalf, right? There has to be payback. There has to be some kind of retribution. That's the way we approach things. Jesus' way is, somebody hurts you, you forgive them. And like Peter asked him, well, how many times do I have to do that? Like seven times? Like how about 70 times seven, right? How about you just keep doing it until you lose count? Right? Continue to forgive. Love covers over a multitude of sins because when somebody hurts you and you don't hurt them back, when you forgive them, when you allow love to prevail over your desire for retribution, the cycle ends there. And this is important, not just for your sake, not just for their sake, but for the whole community, the whole family. Families get torn apart when you get the cycle of retribution going back and forth, the cycle of revenge. You did this to me, so I got to do this to you. And guess what? Both sides always feel like they were the first victim. Isn't that how it goes? Have you ever been around a family that is undergoing the process that some parents passed away and their adult children are having to deal with the estate? Man, does that get ugly. And working in a bank, I get to see some of that firsthand, right? Some ugly things happen. These, these, you know, you did this thing to me when we were four years old and like I still resent it and because of that I, I want the grandfather clock and so the, me wanting the grandfather clock and, and the, this amount of money plus the thing you did to me when I was a kid, like it all just get, gets mushed together, right? And all these very complicated feelings, it gets very heated, it gets ugly fast. Right? We tend to do that. How many wars have been fought just because both sides have this long, long history of like, yeah, but years ago you did this to me. Well, I only did that because you did this to my people. And it just goes on and on and on. Peter says love is the only thing that stops that. Forgiveness is the only thing that stops that. That love can cover over a multitude of sins, not in the sense of pretending that they're not there, but in refusing to respond in kind. It protects me, it protects you, it protects us as a family from being ripped apart from within. It protects the entire community. So he says to do that. He says to be hospital and gracious, right? Don't complain. Don't grumble. Don't grumble about, being, about showing hospitality and being generous to people in the family. Love each other. Treat each other like family. And he says, serve one another with the gifts of grace you've received, right? So he, he, he mentions two specifically, but they're actually more like general. They kind of cover about everything. He says, and basically, anytime you're speaking, Speak as though you're speaking the very words of God. And anytime you're serving, you're doing, do it with God's strength. Right? It just kind of covers all the bases there. If we want to get into spiritual gifts, it just kind of includes everything, I think. So if you're, if you're preaching or teaching or you're leading a Bible study or you're just speaking up in a Bible study or you're just pulling somebody aside and, 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 and giving them some advice or mentoring somebody, if you're teaching kids in a classroom, whatever you're doing, it's not just your time to get up on a soapbox and talk about whatever you like talking about. It's not just your ego happy hour, right? It is, it is a time for you to speak God's words on God's behalf. So approach that with humility and reverence. Man, I don't really deserve to be here. I'm just going to do the best I can to communicate the words of God to you. And whatever you do, don't just do it out of your own strength. Do it out of God's strength. Rely on him to give you the strength to do what needs to be done, to serve other people, to do the right thing. We're going to pick it up. We're going to read a little bit in chapter 5 here, starting in chapter 5, verse 1. He's going to single out leaders in the church, specifically elders. He's going to say, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Right? Just like Jesus tells his disciples in Mark 10. He says, hey, if anybody wants to be great, become the servant, become the least. Because in in God's way of viewing it, the only correct way to approach a position of authority or leadership is to do so as a servant, to put others first. Why? Because even Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Peter says when you do that, when leaders in the church, when leaders put other people first, they don't go after a dishonest gain, they're not in it for the power to say, hey hey, everybody, look how important I am. And by the way, I just want to say, the elders in this church, in my experience, have been 
Excellent examples of that. Some of the most humble guys I have ever met. What, what's that? Yeah, well, I was mainly talking about Al. But, <laughs> so, but seriously, so much humility, so much love and care for this flock. You know what? And there's always going to be disagreements. There's always going to be imperfection. But, but Peter says, if you are in a position of leadership, Approach it with that humility where you are genuinely in it to serve, to help. You're not in it for your health. You're not in it so people think that you're great. You're not in it so that you can get your way and get everything you want. You're in it for other people. Because, he says, guess what? Be a good shepherd because Mr. Boss Shepherd is coming back. And he's going to have some questions about how you took care of the sheep while he was gone. So if, you're in a, if you ever find yourself, and this is true in any position of leadership in the church, in your workplace, in your family or your community or your home, wherever it might be, if you're in a position either of, of some position and title of leadership or just like people just listen to you and look to you and are interested in what, you have to, what, what your thoughts are on something, that your opinion has, has sway, any situation like that, the most important thing is that you have the humility to put other people first, regardless of what you want to trust other people, to love other people, and to really seek what's in their best interests. And he goes on. He doesn't just talk to the leaders. Oh, let me say one more thing. He says, when the chief shepherds appear, if you do this, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Like Jesus says in Matthew 25 in that parable, well done, good and faithful servant. Be the kind of leader that when the great shepherd comes back, says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come share in my glory. That'll be a good day, right? I hope. Let's, let's let it be a good day, right? But he can't talk about that with it without talking about the other end of it too. He says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, all of you, now, so that you younger, he specifies those who are on the younger end of the spectrum, but then he's going to say all of you though, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because, and he's quoting Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. You want to talk about leaders and saying, hey, leaders, lead well. Well, guess what? Everybody else, if you're not in a position of leadership, you need to serve too. You, if the leaders need humility, you need humility too. There's a time and a place, there's a time and a place when you know better. When if they would just listen to you, if they would just give you a chance, if somebody would just listen to your ideas, you know what? The leaders should be listening. That's on them. They should listen. But so should you too. Everybody ought to listen. It ought to go both ways. Where those who are leading have humility and say, hey, I'm just in it for you. And, and are listening and have the humility to hear ideas that might not have come from their own brains. Right? But actually listen to the people around them. And there's a time and a place too when those of us on the, on the, on the other end who might not be in a position of leadership where you need to show some healthy respect. You need, to, you need to respect the office at some point. There comes a point where you need to have the humility yourself to say, you know what, I've got some ideas. Maybe I've got some criticisms. I've got opinions about the way things are being handled. But at the same time, those people who are in leadership, I love those people. And I care about them. And what's good for them is more important to me than what's good for me. Because that's what Jesus did. That's the attitude Jesus has. And if Jesus has that attitude, man, if Jesus has that attitude, who am I? Who am I to think that I ought to always get my way? Who am I to think that I have all the answers, that I have all the big ideas? And it, it's, it needs to be a healthy relationship in both directions. You know, they say, I heard somebody say recently in a TV show, youth is wasted on the young, is what people always say. Don't let the wisdom of age be wasted on you. That goes both ways, right? Youth can be wasted by the young. The wisdom of age can be wasted on, on, the, on the wise, which ironically is not very wise. Let's be good listeners. Let's have humility. Let's put other people first. That's the, that's the core of this. He's going to go on. Um, in, in, in a little bit, we're going to read this. But, but this, basically, Peter, Peter's making these three points, remember. He's saying, as you suffer, you are in this environment, in this situation where life is hard. Things are not always straightforward. They're not always simple. Things are not always going to go the way they, that we want them to. Things are not always going to go the way that they should. Life is not always going to be what we hope it will be. It won't always work out the way we want it to. But as we live in this world, that's the reality we're in. As we live in that reality, 
let's live in it the way that Jesus did. And if need be, let's die in it the way that Jesus did. And the way that Jesus approached that was he suffered well. He suffered well by embracing being weird, by being very okay with being weird. He did it by standing his ground when it mattered and not compromising on the truth. And he did it by loving his family well. And as God graciously invites us to be his children and be a part of his family, he wants us to love each each other well. Those of you who are parents understand what that's like, don't you? To be, it gives you a little glimpse into God's perspective on the world. Because I love this kid, and I also love this kid. But this kid wants to hurt this kid, and now this kid has to hurt the other kid back. Or this kid just thinks that that one's going to hurt her, and so she's preemptively striking, and it's like, it gets crazy. God, as the father, looks down and says, I love both of you, like, just don't touch each other. Leave each other alone, right? Right? Like, like everybody's dad has probably said at some point, I don't care who started it, I'll finish it. Now, usually what your dad meant was a very specific way that he was going to finish that. What God means is, I want you to stop it. I want you to forgive each other and love each other and take care of each other. It's not about vengeance. It's not about getting what you deserve. It's about giving to the other person what I want for them because I have given you what I want for you. And if God has loved us like that, who are we to hold that love back from other people? Who are we to treat the people around us any differently? What makes us so important that we could ever not do the same for other people around us? So suffer like Jesus. Embrace his weirdness. Just get comfortable in it because God accepts you. When the time comes, dig your feet in and don't don't give up. Be stubborn about what matters. Be faithful to Jesus even if you're the only one doing it, even if everybody's going to hate you and think you're an idiot and think you're crazy and criticize you and say nasty things behind your back. Do it anyway. And don't forget that you have a loving family here that cares about you. Let's be a loving family. Let's take good care of each other. Let's be there for each other. When the world rejects us, let's be a safe haven for each other in here. Let's show hospitality without complaining, without grumbling. Let's have humility and put each other's needs first. Let's take care of each other as a family because Jesus takes such good care of us. Let's do the same for one another. And I just want to wrap up. I have nothing better to say than what Peter says here picking up in, in chapter 5, verse 7, and just reading through the end, of the, the end of the letter here. He says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Can I, just, can I just read that again? The people he's writing to, the anxiety they're experiencing, the pain they're experiencing, the isolation and the loneliness and the rejection and the attacks on every side that they're feeling. And he says, all of that, all of that anxiety... Cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion just looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will restore you and will make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And Peter adds some personal notes. He says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, he's probably talking about Rome there, kind of using code for Rome. Not even code, just kind of bashing Rome by calling them Babylon. Um, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Right, so Chuck and Al after church, kiss of love. All right, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in these these challenges that we're facing of various kinds. God, give us the strength and that steadfastness to stand firm. Teach us to love others the way that you do, to put others first the way that you do, 
Teach us to be comfortable being your children. Lord, let that be enough for us. If there's anyone in this room that doubts that you love them that way, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't really believe that you feel that way about them, I pray that you'd make that really clear right now. God, your love and the, the way that you accept us as we are, God, I pray that you make that really clear to everyone here. God, let us be secure and strong and firm in that, in knowing who you are and knowing what you've called us to. God, fill us with your spirit. Speak to us and show us your love and teach us to love others the same way. Most of all, help us to know you, Jesus. I pray for that for this church for all the years to come and for every person in here. Lord, we all pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.